We're going to continue our sermon series in Ephesians. I am who you say I am. We've been talking about our identity in Christ, how we are not just what the world says we are, what Satan says we are, or what our past mistakes or failures say we are, but we are who God says we are. He made us, and He calls us each by name, and He gets to define our identity. And we've been wanting that identity to come from His Word, and that Word renew our mind and therefore change our life. Every spiritual battle is won or lost in the mind. If Satan can trick you to think you're something you're not, then you'll act in disobedience to God's wills and and God's ways. But if you can truly believe you're a son and that your father's good and you can believe that you're forgiven and you can believe you're a saint, well, then you'll act in obedience and in accordance with God's will and God's ways. So we talked about how first becomes belief and then behavior. And religion is the other way around. Change the behavior on the outside and then perhaps with enough wishful thinking with enough belief, you can be approved by God. That's all the other religions of the world, but Christianity says, no, no, no. Change the being, which is what God did on the cross when He died for you. He changed. If you receive it, you can be born again. You change your belief, which means you come into alignment with the reality of your new being, and then eventually the behavior will change. This is the good news of the gospel, that You were dead in Christ, but now you can be made alive. I'm just so thankful to be in a community that is passionate about walking together in Jesus. I've been seeing it, you guys, in our house churches. I've been seeing it in our discipleship meetings. I've been seeing it in my one-on-one coffees. Just the transformation of people in our community seeking God, choosing to take Him at His word, even though sometimes it's hard to believe, and in doing so, then their life changes. I've been watching it. I've been watching the hope come. I've been watching the restoration. I've been watching the commitment, the discipline, people overcoming sins and habits and patterns, and overcoming hurts and woundedness. And we're doing it in community. We're doing it as a family. You're not alone on this journey of trying to figure out your identity. You've got other brothers and sisters around you here to remind you, no, this is what the Bible says. This is who you really are. Believe it. Receive it. And you'll see it. You know, today we're going to be jumping into the next passage, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But before we do, I just want to tee it up because it's... This has got to be one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. I'm sure for some of you it is also. We've all heard stories of rescues, someone being pulled out of danger, being saved. And it it resonates with us, the the self-sacrifice to put another person's need above your own and actually risk your life to save theirs. We, We see it as heroic right? The firefighter who rushes into the burning building, the lifeguard who rescues one from the waves as they're caught in the undertow and being dragged out to sea. One of the most uh, intense rescue stories I ever heard was a, a mom who, in surging with adrenaline to save her young child underneath a car, was able to lift it just enough to drag her child out from certain death. We've heard these kind of stories, you know, the people doing the unthinkable and sometimes in the spur of a moment risking their life for someone else's. I was watching uh, even last night with the flooding going on in North Carolina and, and people risking their lives to save neighbors, sometimes to save strangers, reaching out a hand, creating human chains to keep someone from getting dragged away in a mudslide. There's something about our love and our commitment when we see someone on the brink of death that we're able to get outside of ourselves 
put ourselves in harm's way and see that person rescued. And that's what I think Paul's getting at in a, in a small way. We've seen it on the human level, but Jesus has done it on a supernatural, spiritual level. Jesus stood in the way of everything that was aimed at you, and he risked his life to save yours. The great exchange, we call it God's grace, scandalous grace, that God would live a perfect life and yet take all the punishment. We would live a sinful life and then inherit his reward. It's the great exchange, and it's grace because we all know we don't deserve it. I want to imagine just for a moment that you're in the situation because it's, it's easy to let these spiritual realities not sink in. We're like, well, yeah, I mean, he paid for my sin, whatever that means. I've got bills to pay. Like, let's move on with life. It's like, well, hold on a second. Just like wrap your mind around the condition that you were in before Jesus. I think this is what the passage I'm about to read is trying to do. Paul's trying to remind us, remember how bad it was? Why would he do that? Because I think he wants you to know how good it is. If you can remember how bad it was apart from Jesus, you'll remember how good it is to be in Christ, and then the enemy can't trick you to be out of Christ because you're like, no, no, I did that before. I remember being the God of my own life. It only brought death. Death of hope, death of relationships, death of habits, death of my physical body, health, like it brought death. I'm not going there again. What I have in Jesus is life. I have the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace, and patience, and gentleness, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and self-control. So Paul is going to create this contrast. Remember how bad it was so you can re remember how good it is, and you stay in Christ. Now, I just want to do that with you. So imagine that you are lost at sea, and you're not just drowning. You've already sunk to the bottom of the ocean. You've already lost your breath, lifeless. There's no way of reaching the surface. You can't try harder. You can't swim up. There's no life preserver to grab because you're already dead. You're a corpse at the bottom. It's done. Lifeless, no heartbeat. That's the state that we were in before Jesus. <laughs> That's what Paul says. Spiritually dead. He didn't say spiritually half dead or spiritually struggling or spiritually drowning. He said spiritually dead, corpse, bottom of the ocean. But Jesus, but God. We're going to read in Ephesians 2, verse 4, my favorite but in all the Bible. Can I say that? I'm a youth pastor at heart. My favorite but, but God. See, what Jesus did is he came down to that lifeless corpse and picked you up and swam you to the surface and resuscitated you and gave you Holy Spirit CPR and gave you gospel defibrillators and shocked you back to life. And then he poured out his love and affirmation on you and gave you discipleship physical therapy so you could learn to use your limbs again. And he set your feet on a rock and he gave you the instruction manual on life, his love letter, the Bible, and he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He resuscitated you back to life. This is what God's grace does. It, it brings dead things back to life. So my big idea today, very simple, God's grace brings dead things back to life. If we could go there, Evan. Um, sorry, one more. Let's go to the big idea if you have it. You don't, do you not have it? Maybe you don't. Okay, you can go back to the slide. That's okay. Sorry, Evan. I thought we had that. God's grace brings dead things back to life. Maybe you could type that slide for me, Evan, since that's what that slide's supposed to be. But this is good, too. This is the affirmation we're going to make at the end of this sermon, and I'm going to tee you up for it now. We'll do an Oreo sandwich with it. Because every week we've been doing this identity statements, declarations out loud, renewing our minds. I am who you say I am, made alive in Christ. So we're going to Oreo sandwich it this time while Evan's typing that slide for me. The big idea again, Evan, God's grace brings dead things back to life. 
So let's just, I just want you to repeat after me in faith, and then at the end of the sermon, we'll do it again, and you'll believe it more because you'll have heard my reasonings. Just repeat after me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Made alive. Made alive. In, Christ. in Christ. Come on. You guys are awake this morning. This is good. Did that give you enough time, Evan? God's grace brings dead things back to life. Yeah. Because I might want to go back to that slide, so. It's good that Evan typed it up. That's... Do you believe this? Yes. Because this is the gospel. You didn't deserve the resurrection of Christ. You didn't deserve to be brought back to life. You know, this is on the macro and the micro. On the macro, literally, you will get a new body if you're a, a Christian, if you're in Christ, and you will be brought back from death to life unless you're alive and you're here and, and the Lord returns and you meet with Him in the clouds. Even then, you still get a new body and what's dead is brought back to life in a different way. So this will happen on the macro. You will resurrect. You will live eternally. You will be brought to new life. It also happens on the micro. There's small ways in our, in our life, in our journey, where we start to give way to death. We start to give way to despair. We start to believe Satan's lies, that things can't change, which is the definition of dead, by the way. All living organisms grow. All living organisms change. When things stop changing and they stop growing, they start decaying and they start dying. That's the life cycle. And so we start to believe, oh, that can't change, that can't improve, that can't multiply, that can't get better, and that's death. And so what God's grace does is it comes into the situation and it says, no, that can change, that can grow, that can improve and then multiply. You can redeem the past. There is a second chance for you. I do have a hopeful future for you. You can have a family. You can be a man or woman of God. You can have an incredible marriage. You can beat this addiction. You can get physically healthy. You can overcome. You can stop this sin pattern. You can walk in righteousness. See, whenever you hear those type of messages of hope, messages of promise, messages of overcoming, it's God's grace meeting you. You might not think it that way because you might think God's grace is just there to forgive me when I mess up. No, no, no. His mercy will catch you when you mess up and he won't punish you like you deserve. That's mercy. His grace is there to pick you back up and empower you and teach you how to do it and to go again. God's grace is more than just forgiveness. It's part of God's grace, mercy and forgiveness. But part of God's grace is raising you up to new life and seating you with Him in heavenly places. Guess what that means? Authority, power, decisions, action. So I want to read this scripture together. My favorite but in the Bible. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, say dead, dead. he made us alive, say alive. alive, together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Have you ever wondered, why is God doing all of this? We missed the mark. We blew it. We're sinners. We're rebels. We all know it. We all disobeyed. We all have thoughts, intentions, and actions that are displeasing to God, and we all know it brings death. We've done it. We, it and yet, He went on a rescue mission and saved us and shows us mercy and forgiveness and then grace and empowerment and exaltation next to Him forever in the age to come, and He makes us royalty, and He puts a crown on our head, and He not only erases our debt, but then he gives us inheritance, streets of gold, and rewards. Why? Why is he doing this? To show his immeasurable riches of his grace. He wants you to know how gracious he is and how kind he is towards you. He wants you to know he's kind. Thank you, God, for showing off with your kindness. So unlike us human, when we show off, we want to show off our strength or impressiveness. We want to do it for our pride, vanity, or ego. When he shows off, he's literally, it says, to show, that he might show. He's showing off. But guess what God's showing off with? 
kindness, compassion. He wants to show off His grace. I just, want to, I just want to break this down a little bit, and then there's so much more that I want to say here, but let's just look at this together. But God, being rich in mercy, God's not broke. He hasn't run out. He hasn't just stopped with you and said, oh, that's it. That's the mercy line. No, rich, abundant in mercy. But Rob, you don't understand. I mean, I literally just blew it the same thing yesterday. He's rich in mercy. He's ready to meet you. But not only that, not only to forgive you, he's ready to raise you to new life again, to conquer that thing. Will you finally trust him and let him raise you up? You're already seated in heavenly places. Do you know it? Do you know that you have authority over that thing? Because if you believe it, you'll behave it. Because of the great love. That's the cause. Because. Why? Why would he make us alive? We're dead. Why would you go find a dead corpse and shock it back to life with the gospel and breathe life into it and make that and adopt that thing and make it your son or daughter? Because he loves his great love. Great love. And I wish everyone could be a parent. I know it's not God's will for everyone. I know it is God's will for some, and they neglect it or stall because they think parent, kids are going to be a burden. And, and in our society, we want the pleasure without the responsibility, and so we just eliminate kids rather than actually take responsibility for kids. And I know there's some in a really hard and unique circumstance, and they, they feel totally incapable, and they need to surrender the rights of their kids to others to help parent them. And I'm glad we have people in our uh, community and people working in the kids' ministry like Katie that work for adoption agencies. And I know parenting can be complex, but I'm telling you, you guys, when you can be a parent, I wish everyone could experience it because you start to feel that great love. <laughs> it's like, why put up with this person's constant tantrums and sin and, and headache and poopy diapers and just, and then equip them and love them and serve them at your own expense and then eventually train them in the way that they should go and, and empower them to live a godly, righteous life. I mean, what? Love. Great love. You start to feel it as a parent when you're in the spirit. When you're in the flesh, you might not feel it, right? You might feel more annoyance. You might feel... But so many of the questions I had, a lot of the why questions I had before marriage and family, experiential, when I started to experience marriage and family, a lot of them were answered. It's like, I, I now ask, what now? Instead of, why? Why would God do that? It's like, oh, that makes sense. We're his kids. Okay, what now? Am I going to obey him or not? Am I going to trust him or not? And so I encourage you guys to tap into that fatherly love. He's a father. That's why. You might think, yeah, random stranger or even worse, a random criminal drowning or at the bottom of the sea, you might not say, but if it's your own kid, what do you do? You jump in there. You bring them back to life. That's why. Why would Jesus exchange his life for ours? Why would he make that which is dead alive? Because we're his kids. We're his kids. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, look at that word trespass. The, such an interesting word that Paul uses. Trespassing is when you're somewhere you're not supposed to be. You've legally crossed a threshold. You're on someone else's property. And in fact, in Colorado, we have the make my day law where you can, if you cross into someone's property and you're a threat to them and it was unannounced, that they have the right to defend themselves, to arm themselves, to stop you as an intruder on their property. And this word trespass, when it, it, I, I think it really connects with this word death that Paul uses because when we disobey God, when we sin, we're somewhere we're not supposed to be. We're in enemy territory, right? Our life is at stake. We're, we can sense and feel that it's not God's will and God's best. And Ultimately, if you trespass too much, if you go into severe behind enemy lines, like in war, it can be the end of you. And I just, I, I think this is an interesting way to think about sin. Like when you choose to go against God's best for you that he's revealed in the Bible, do you see it that way? Like I'm trespassing, I'm, I'm, in, I'm violating 
property rights. It's a really interesting legal term that Paul uses here. And I think if you could, see, like, it would help convict us of like, oh man, and it would help just steer us in the right direction. Sin isn't that really good thing that, that is just so pleasurable that God says you can't have. Sin is crossing into hell, and you're not supposed to be there, and, you don't, and why would you go there anyway? It's trespassing. It's only going to bring death. Like if you saw all these signs, warning, landmines, death imminent, stay out. Like, don't go back. We're still clearing all these landmines out from, from World War II. Don't walk on this field. You'd be like, whoa. Like, why would you go prancing around in there trying to figure out exactly where the landmines are and how much you can walk through it without blowing yourself up? Just, to, just okay, I'm just going to walk. There's a beautiful, nice road here with fall leaves. Like, I'm going to stay out of where the ring raids are. Like, He made us alive together with Christ. We're going to focus this whole sermon on made us alive, so I won't spend a ton of time on that phrase right this moment because that's what the whole sermon is called, made alive. But I do want to look at that little italicized word, together. It's already good news that you're not dead. But it would be not as good news if you were not dead and alone. He made us alive. Good luck. Good riddance. You're alive again. Don't drown and die again in your sin. Like, no, you're alive and I'm with you. That's a good dad. He's right here. He made us alive together with Christ. He rose first and then we rise with him. And you guys, you don't have to do it alone. So many of you, the Christian journey is not working for you. You know your way didn't work. You're like, okay, that brought death and addiction and pain and struggle. But I've tried it God's way. No, because you're, you're not doing it together. You're doing it in your own strength and you're doing it alone. You're not praying. You're not meditating. You're not fasting. You're not reading the word. All those spiritual disciplines, you guys, aren't just religiosity. It's so that you can do it together. If you can do it together, you can stay on the path. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up. Guys, this is the, the second half of grace that people forget about. God wants to raise you up and seat you with him in heavenly places. Why does Paul mention this? Because he wants you to know, like, yes, he brought you from death to life. But again, it wasn't just cancel the debt. You're back to zero. Now do your best. Try to figure it out. It was, no, no, no. Cancel the negative infinity debt that you owed me, and I give you positive infinity to your account. You are with me forever. You're raised. You're seated. It's done. You have power. I want you to rule with me. I mean, what kind of God is this that shares his throne? What kind of God is this that not only brings us to life, but then promotes us to be leaders alongside of him? This is audacious. This is good news. And why did he do it all? I already mentioned this. He wants to show off, <laughs> but not the way we think. He wants to show off his kindness. The Apostle Paul doesn't hold back, right? He doesn't pull punches. He says that when you trespass, when you go to where you're not supposed to be, and you are in Satan's playground, it's, it just brings death. This word dead, he could have used any other word, but he says you're dead in your trespasses. And it's important that you remember that. You're not just lost. You're not just struggling. You're not just confused. Apart from Jesus, you're dead. And we like to use these euphemisms to try to weasel our way out of how serious the situation is. Like, I'm just really struggling with this. With this. No, you're dying. And if, if you're not in Christ, you're actually, you are dead. If you're in Christ, why would you zombie your way back to the grave? That thing is death. Like, we got to start actually using the language the Bible uses because it's like a smelling salt to our soul. And it makes us realize really what's at stake here. So if you've ever felt like some Christians are a little bit overly dramatic, like, this is life or death. Put down the pornography. Put down the vape pen. Put down the, the anxiety and the panic. Put down the doom scrolling. And you're like, oh, come on. It's, it's, yeah, it's probably not... It's a struggle, I'll admit. No, it's death. If it's not God's best, if it's not what he's designed for you, and it's 
pulling you away from him and it's distracting you from him and it's, you're trusting him less, not more, then it's death. If it's a trespass, it's death. And we could spend a whole sermon on, well, what's actually a trespass and what's not a trespass? And that's, the Bible lays some of those things out for us. We've already read about them, right? That the works of the flesh are evident. I think Andrew went through some of those lists last week, sexual immorality and, and envy and gossip and slander and just on and on the list goes, strife. And so if you're confused on what actually is a trespass, keep reading the Bible. It's really not that confusing. And if you don't know exactly chapter and verse, obey your conscience. Your conscience is speaking to you. The Bible says anything done against your own conscience is sin. But some of our consciences have been dulled, and I think that's part of why we need the scriptures to wake us back up. Like, whoa, when I trespass, when I do what I know is off limits for a Christian, it's death. But God being rich in mercy, he doesn't leave you there. He doesn't shoot on sight. Trespasser, shoot on sight. No, no, no. Trespasser, oh, he's already dead. Dang, Satan shot him on sight. <sighs> Resuscitation, gospel defibrillator. Dude, come, on, come back over here. Don't go back over there. Go, go, go. <laughs> and we're like, but how close can I get to that line? He's like, what? I just literally went behind enemy lines to get you out of that mess. You want to go back to it? Like a dog returning to its vomit, the Bible says, we go back to our sin. Guys, this isn't just a promise of a future reality, it's here and now. When we read like seated in heavenly places, yeah, one day that's going to be the case. Paul writes it in the present tense, you're seated in heavenly places now. It's already happened. Live from that reality. Live from victory. Live from your sonship. Live from royalty. You know, this, this message from Paul is profound to Jewish readers and to, to Greco-Roman readers. To a Jewish reader, when you're reading this, wow, he takes what's dead and makes it back to life. You'd, it'd be reminiscent of Ezekiel's dry bones. You would think, wow, the, I remember Ezekiel saying, that, and God with Ezekiel saying, can, can this valley of dry bones live? And what does Ezekiel say? Only you know, God. He says, prophesy to the bones that they shall live. And here, Paul in New Testament is saying, God's taken what is dead and he's made it alive in Christ. Guys, I think anyone that has a Jewish background would be reading Paul's words. Oh, Jesus is the fulfillment of Ezekiel. Jesus, the resurrection of power of Jesus, the grace that he shows us to give us new life now and forevermore, the grace that he shows us to bring dead hope back to life. Dead relationships, back to life. My eventually, my dead body, back to life. That's the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. It would have been also profound for Greco-Roman context because think about it. You're in Ephesus. You're in this, like we've talked about before, this trade center, and it's a pagan worship of Artemis, and it's a powerful city with, with uh, political rulers and emperors. I mean, when he says, you are seated in heavenly places. It's, it's a little bit scandalous to say such a thing in such a culture. By saying that believers are seated with Christ, Paul's reminding them your, your identity is not tied to the empire. It's not tied to Rome. It's not tied to the idols and to the cultural standards and to Artemis and the seven ancient wonders of, seven wonders of the ancient world. Like, your identity is in Christ. You've got a higher throne. You actually are already promoted beyond all of these human systems. Now, you can honor the government while also, as a Christian, sometimes resisting the government if, if it contradicts our faith. But I think Paul's wanting them to know, by the way, you guys supersede the government. You're, <laughs> you're, you're already in heavenly places. So I think a, a, a non-Jewish reader that's in the city of Ephesus would be so relieved by this. What, I get a share in the reign of Christ that's bigger than Caesar? What, there's no other thing, I mean, no other threat that could take me out. It transcends earthly powers. Look at this cross-reference, Colossians 2, 13 through 14. 
Paul makes very similar, similar arguments in the book of Colossians as he does in Ephesians. Different church, different city, slightly different um, applications, but very similar ideas and, and arguments that I want to just wrestle through here together. Colossians 2, 13 through 14, when you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. There it is again. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of the legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away. He nailed it to the cross. Both of these passages emphasize that we were dead. Before God's intervention, we're dead. Without Him, we're dead. Without Him, it's hopeless. Without Him, we're lost. And we, we have to remember this. Even as Christians, if you're not a Christian, that might sound so discouraging, but I got good news for you. You don't have to stay dead. Would you just receive the life that Jesus has for you? It's your only hope. Take it. But if you're already a Christian, why even remember that, Rob? I don't want to go back there. No, Paul is asking us to remember before Jesus, you're dead, because it will cause appreciation and wonder and worship in the reality of our life in Christ, and it will keep us from going back to the things that we know once brought us death, but both passages say the same thing. You were dead in your sins and now you're made alive. I love that language, made alive. You're not just given the opportunity of life. You're not just, you know, given the chance to choose life. You're made alive. He just, he did it for you on your behalf. That's why it's called grace. But both scriptures also have a contrast, right? Ephesians emphasizes that you're seated in heavenly places with authority. Colossians emphasizes your record of debt is canceled. Both are needed, you guys. I would say one has more of a focus of that mercy, not giving you what you deserve. That's the Colossians, right? Your record of debt is canceled, nailed to the cross. Clean slate. But I love what Ephesians emphasizes. Seated in heavenly places, raised to new life. You have authority, you have power. Grace is the empowerment of God to do the will of God. Do you remember this is what he did for you? Some of you know it more than others because some of you remember how it was before Jesus. Some of you have a harder time because you've deceived yourself into thinking your life wasn't too bad before Jesus and you forget. Or maybe you've never truly tasted and seen how good God is and the life that Jesus promises because you've never fully surrendered and fully trusted him. And so then you don't have the contrast. You don't have the stench of the tomb and then the embracing of of family and love and new life because you've actually never jumped all in with this thing called Christianity. You've dipped your toe in the water. I would exhort you and encourage you to go all in because when you go all in, you can taste and see that he is good and then you can really see the contrast. Wow, that was darkness compared to this light. You might be wondering what this is all about. I, uh, I, I worked really hard trying to find a actual defibrillators. Turns out no one wants to let you borrow those just in case. <laughs> Talk to several pastor buddies, and, and we, don't, we don't have one here on the premise, but the pastors that were like, yeah, we've got one. I'm like, can I borrow it? They're like, uh, I don't think that's a great idea. I'm like, I just need it for a sermon prop. I'm like, can I borrow the case? Uh, it's mounted to the wall. So it was kind of fun going on a, an uh, AED, I think they're called. Um, I was hunting for one. But imagine this is an AED. Because this is just a little med kit. This is just a little health kit. But even the little items that might be, that are in here, could save somebody's life. How much more so a CPR kit? How much more so an AED or a defibrillator? And I wanted this up here just during the sermon to remind us like, this is what Jesus did. He took us when we were already flatlined. And he shocked us back to life with the good news of the gospel, with his love, with his mercy. And what Paul says, his grace. It is by grace you have been saved. 
You can't deserve it. You can't ever earn it. What can a dead man do? But you can receive it. You can believe it. You can say thank you. You can go and live your life as a thank you note to the one who brought you back to it. When you truly realize what Christ done, has done for you, you will have no problem surrendering your entire future to him and all of your choices. Because it's, it's like I had zero choices before you anyway. Now the fact that I even get to participate in this thing called life is a gift. So what do you want? Thank you. Every breath is yours. You gave it back to me. I give it back to you. Well, look at Augustine of Hippo. Before his conversion, some of you might know, uh, St. Augustine was consumed by lust and ambition and intellectual pride. He pursued uh, worldly pleasures. He tried to find fulfillment in everything outside of Christ. As the Bible says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, if you're outside of Christ. He wrote in his book, Confessions, talking about his conversion to Christianity and his life before Jesus. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our souls will be restless until they find their rest in you. You might have heard that quote. And I know this sermon's about coming from death to life, which could mean so many different things to different people. Whatever the thing is that you think's dead or has no hope, God can give you hope and life. And some things need to stay dead because they're not from God. And it's good news that they're dead. But other things God wants to restore and bring back to life for you. But specifically, I felt this need, and I think it was confirmed in the Selah moment from, from Bob's word and from some of these prayers from the prayer team, Anxiety. Augustine said, you will be restless until you find your rest in Him. Part of this new life in Jesus, like Bob was saying, is your rest in Him, your peace. Augustine found God's grace. He had a, re a remarkable conversion. I don't have time to go into all of it today. It's pretty incredible. I encourage you to read some of these early church fathers, some of the, the older writings or some of the better writings. I still read modern authors too and pastors, but these early church fathers just had incredible insight and wisdom. I encourage you to go check it out. But he says in his book, Confessions, it was your grace, God, that delivered me from myself my own desires and sins that were bringing me down to death. Um, I want to share one story right now. Uh, Megan, if you would come up here. This is my sister, Megan. I want you to give her a hand. Come on, this is exciting. Um, if we could, I know some people went out in the lobby or parking lot and stuff, so I don't know, Hayden, if you could, or some, yeah, Raylan's going to do a little loop, let them know we're back in service here. They're like, ooh, intermission, I'm leaving. Um, <laughs> Megan, my sister, thank you for coming. Um, I need that microphone, honey. It's, yeah, there we go. So my sister has an incredible story of coming out of darkness and into light and second chances and redemption as she is now two and a half years sober. Come on, give her a hand. And filled with hope and life, and I'm sure every day there's, that, there's a battle, but she's winning with Jesus and her daughter, Victory. Mom, would you bring her up? Victory, come on up. Come on up. Yeah. Victory. Oh. So, Megan, would you tell us a little of your story and just... Yeah, feel free to use the table and just share what God's done in your life and how you've been able to overcome. And so, oh, gosh, um, I wrote a little something. I'm just going to read from uh, what I said. But <clears throat> when we say, yea, though I walk through the valley of death, that was where I was living. In the darkness and despair, in desperation and despondency, hopelessness had a death grip on me. I knew God was there, but thought I must be the one who's not worth saving. 
Homeless, lost, walking through fire, alcohol riddled and foggy minded and so, so very alone. I was in LA, dirty and broken and so very full of terror. Everything was terrifying. The riots and the fires and the looting, surrounded by dr drugs, death and thievery, just trying every day to simply survive and endure. Everyone was in the grips of COVID fear, so everything was closed. There were no bathrooms. There was no water to be found anywhere. No shelter, no food. I got sick and I was hospitalized for a full week, even when the hospital were turning people away because I had an ascending kidney infection from not being able to go to the bathroom, not having enough water, and alcohol was the only liquid I drank. And liquor stores were the only thing that's open. I had MRSA, dehydration, and malnutrition on top of the infection. All this from following a man who did not even love me, chasing a love only God can provide. I was living a daily life of fear, hunger, and an unquenchable thirst trying to fill my emptiness. Loving him was like chasing a snake who had bit you and trying to explain why you didn't deserve to be bit, all while the poison is already rotting you from inside. My dry bones and my dying heart were leading me into spiritual, emotional, and physical death. Surely the devil thought he had me. When Jesus showed himself and declared in an unshakable and undefeatable voice, you're mine. This is my child whom I love. He had left the 99 to save me when I went to the hospital with heat stroke and found out I was pregnant. In this moment, he said to me, not only will I rescue you, but I will give you the deepest desire of your heart, a child, an undeniable miracle. When I was furthest from him and when pain and shame were on the throne of my heart, he saw fit to, to give me a miracle. When, a, when I placed a man as an idol in my life, he still performed a miracle. I know Rob spoke of the defibrillation. <laughs> I think my experience was more like God, the great physician, was performing CPR. Chest compressions and life-giving air on someone who had signed a do not resuscitate. And long past time, CPR would be effective. Yet he kept going. He kept fighting for me when anyone else would have declared time of death. Hmm. I was awoken and given the breath of life, but that doesn't automatically take away wounds. Some things heal more quickly than others. While Band-Aids and bruises were healing quickly, over these past few years, there's also the rooting out of infections happening. There was stitching up deep cuts and the resetting of broken bones that had healed incorrectly. In some areas, I'm still healing to this day, but the great physician is never impatient. He is never unwilling or too busy to help me. He's never annoyed or aggravated by my questions and concerns. He never dismisses my pain or the tears that it brings. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. And when I feel ugly because of all of my mistakes, he reminds me that my scars show my resilience and God-given strength, and this is my testimony. My story is not a pretty one. My journey was traumatic and scary, and one I don't need to get too into today. But let me say this. My resuscitation led me to redemption, and my restoration led me to revival and a reconcil reconciliation with God's righteousness in me. I stand here today as someone who has been brought back to life as someone who had already been in the grave and looked death in the face. I am alive and well and his spirit is within me and my daughter will be raised in the way she should go so that when she is old, she will not stray from it. Yeah. I'm not perfect, but I am a breaker of generational curses yes. and the conqueror of lifelong lies. Come on. I and my daughter who is healthy despite it all, we are walking miracles and I praise God the Father for it. I never thought I'd be here. I never thought I would make it back into his favor. Yet here I stand appointed, anointed, and undeniably loved. Thank you Come for on. letting me share my story. I hope and yes. pray God uses it to light a fire in the hearts of those who hear it, and that it provides hope for even just one person who is lost. Come on. Yes. Yes, come on. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Bethany, would you come? Let's pray for her. Wow, it's so powerful. Guys, if you only knew, like, like she said, if you want to know more of the details, please talk to her. What she's come back through and had to overcome uh, relationally through the pain of divorces and legally, and the, it can seem overwhelming, some of the things, and, but she's systematically just been tackling all of these things. And now uh, I put on the screen, uh, she's helping women come out of 
addiction. That's her certificate of completion for Advocates for Recovery Colorado. And so now she gets to help people in the same way that she was helped. So I just want to pray for you, sister. Lord, thank you for Megan. Would you just reach out a hand, church, extend a hand. Thank you for her testimony. Thank you that you resuscitated her. Thank you, Lord, that she's living in the light. And I even hear a promise from the Lord right now. And he'll work out all the remnant, all the loose ends. And he's still patient with you even now. If he was patient with you then, how much more so now? Even on the daily things that you're still not proud of. He's just saying, come on, baby girl, you've got this. You're, you're doing great. Keep your chin up. Don't get defeated. So, Lord, I just pray for hope to fill her soul. I pray that her story would encourage spirit and truth in our extended community, Lord, that you are the God that brings life, even when it seemed impossible. I remember on our kitchen floor, Bethany and I, on our knees, writing a song, it's never too late. And we sang it for Megan, and we interceded, and we prayed. And so she's a testimony to the power of your grace, God. She's a testimony to the power of prayer. She's the test, uh, testimony to the power of help and rehab, which is humbling, and the testimony to the power of children and motherhood and legacy. So we bless her now, God, and speak to her, draw near to her, and just even for the courage to drive up here and share today, I pray you would bless her and reward her immediately, not just the age to come, but like in, Lord, in the, in the coming days and weeks, she'd feel your nearness, she'd have opportunity and she'd have momentum in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You. Love you. Wow. <laughs> Eloquent writer, huh? We got to save that. I would put that on the church blog. That's, she's always been a great writer. I remember that. That was, wow. Um, well, church, we're going to go to a time of response uh, as we do. I just want to put a couple practical applications. What do you do with all this? What do you do with all this? Remember your grace. Maybe you do a grace audit. Write down, uh, or I'm sorry, Evan, I had it out of order. Or is that right? Yeah, that's right. Remember grace. Do a grace audit. Write down 10 times God showed you grace and brought you out. And like, this is why journaling is, is so helpful. And so many times in Scripture, He commands the children of Israel, remember, remember, remember. Because you'll see that God is faithful. By the time you finish these lists, you can write a list of how He showed you mercy, a list of how He showed you kindness and love. And yes, those things are, are related, but they're nuanced, they're different. And, and you get these, these lists of remembrance, and you'll be filled with hope and adoration for your King of how much He showed you grace. Two, show grace to others, you guys. Who do you need to show radical CPR-style grace to? There might be someone around you that you've kind of given up on. You think God's given up on them. It's like, well, no, they're, they're just dead. So were you, and God made you alive. Perhaps God might use you by His Spirit to make them alive. So don't give up on people. Yes, there's appropriate boundaries. I'm not talking about those situations where it's toxic or abusive. I'm talking about even then you don't have to give up. You can pray for those people. You can pray for those people. But maybe God might use you to show grace and to rescue someone. And that confirms the word from Ryan and, and from Joel in the Selah moment. Get help. Here's a practical thing. Get help. Megan overcame because she was willing to get help. It's, it's a humbling thing, but God exalts the humble. He works with the humble. He resists the proud. Ask for help. Maybe for some of you, you want to come from death to life. How do I do it? Well, go talk to people who are alive that have done it. Jesus, obviously call on Jesus' name, but also check yourself in to rehab if you need to, or get a counselor and hire one, or go to that marriage retreat. Or find a business coach. Like, what do you need help with? Go get it. Help is out there. And we're just so proud that we want to prove it that we can do it independently. Part of coming to life is getting help. And last, a little practical, help someone. Help someone. Maybe you're already alive in Christ. 
but you see someone who's dead, not just showing them grace, that's part of it. You've got to show them grace, otherwise you'll harden your heart against them. Show them grace, but like practically help them. Maybe you give them a ride, buy them a meal. Maybe you go above and beyond and you let them move in. Who knows? Maybe you check them into the program. Maybe you pay for the counseling. Maybe you just have them over for dinner. So guys, I want to invite the band back up. We're going to respond. This is our most important time. Please hang in there uh, with me. We're going, to, we're going to end here at noon in seven minutes. We're going to sing this last song or two. And this is a chance for you to get prayer, a chance for you to respond to the sermon. There's going to be some deacons up front. And if you have something dead that you want brought back to life, come and get prayer. Have the, have the confidence to, to say like Jesus to Lazarus, come out, wake up, come alive. Maybe for some of you, like, you're just undone with this grace and you're just so grateful for it and you can get prayer to like say, wow, I just... God has brought me from death to life, and I just want to worship him. You don't even have to receive prayer. You can come and just get on your knees and just worship Jesus and sing these songs and pour out your thanksgiving to him. And lastly, um, I just want to say that mantra one more time. So if you put that up there, Evan, the, I am who God says I am. Let's repeat after me. I am who God says I am. Made alive, made alive in Christ. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much that you've made us alive. And I just pray that people would respond that right now there might be one who's coming out of death and into life, maybe for the first time. They're saying, I trust Jesus. And you're doing something in their heart and you're resuscitating them and you're breathing life on them. And they're saying, I want to be alive. I don't want to stay dead. I know my trespasses are killing me and I want to be alive in Christ. Lord, I pray they would come get prayer and come commit their lives to you. Rededicate their lives to you. Lord, but maybe there's someone who's already a believer. They know you. They've come out of death, but they're going back to it. They're returning to it even though they know it's not helpful, and I pray that they too would come and receive conviction and prayer and accountability. And Lord, maybe there's some that just want to praise you for your grace and just get on their knees and worship. So we respond to you, Lord. We sing. We're so grateful. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you that you want to show off your kindness by bringing dead things back to life. You didn't have to do it. You're so good. It's by grace we've been saved, not by our works, not by our effort, not by our merit, not by how impressive we are, but because you have great love and you are rich in mercy and you have brought us to life and seated us in heavenly places. I pray that we walk in that authority. We remember that we're already with you in heaven. We already have won. We're leading and living from a place of victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond. Deacons, let me get a few deacons up here. Why don't you guys stand? Let's sing together, and we'll wrap up here in just a few minutes. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. I've been born again, my heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind, hallelujah, you brought me back to life. I won't forget the moment I heard you call my name Out of the grip of darkness Into the light of grace Just like Lazarus You brought me back to life And 
Where there was dead religion, and now there is living faith. All of my hope and freedom are found in Jesus' name. And just like Lazarus, you brought me back to life. I no longer. But Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. Something says I am guilty. I'll point to the price you paid. When something says I'm not worthy, I'll point to that empty grave. Cause just like Lazarus, you brought me back to life. It's no longer. Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. begin to thank you for all that you've done for me and Jesus to fully praise you is gonna take all eternity cause just like Lazarus you brought me back to life you brought me back to life No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. He had Come me, on, church, sing it out. but Jesus said, you are mine. The enemy thought he, he had me, me, but Jesus, Jesus said, you are mine. mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said, you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said, you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said, you are mine. He had me, but Jesus said, No longer I, no longer I, you live. But Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. Yes. So Jesus, thank you for what you did today. We bless you, God. May spirit and truth be a church that walks in newness of life. May we be a church that remembers apart from you, we're dead, we can do nothing. And may we be a church, Lord, that operates from that authority, that we're seated in heavenly places. And may we be a church, God, a hospital for the broken, a place people can come that are needing real help. Give us the tools and resources to help them. Help us to partner with programs and other ministries that have the tools and resources to help people. 
but I pray that it be inner heart transformation first and then behavior modification. That first it would be an inward heart change, Lord. We love you. We bless you. We thank you for today. You've made us alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Give the Lord a hand. Come on. It's good. All right. We'll see you guys next Sunday, 10 a.m. right here. God bless you.